This episode is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. Guys, I promise you, you want to watch this episode because we have with us special guest Sam Hyde, a.k.a. the Distinguished Gentleman, a.k.a. Moon Man, a.k.a. Gold Striker, and his partner in crime, Jet Neptune. They are the creative minds behind Fish Tank Live. Michael, do you need us for the full hour? <laughs> yes, I do, of course. I so that, <laughs> it'll be fine. I, I'm not going to make it, bro. You're going to make it. You can make it. I promise. <laughs> the, before, before, let me tell the people Just at home who don't know. Fish, one fifth speed. The, the people at home who don't know what Fish Tank Live is. Your let viewers me aren't going to know the difference. If you play it back half speed, your viewers are not going to know the difference. They don't know anything. They don't know how fast I talk. What are you, crazy? You don't know me. Let Michael, me. that was an interesting question. Big fan of yours, by the way. No one has Let's ever told talk. Oh, no, we got to do double speed. If we talk faster, yes. we can get this done in 20 minutes. Okay. It's like on Twin Peaks when they talked backwards and played it backwards. Mm -hmm. Um. Let me explain to you, the audience, what this show is. Jet, can, can you give me a guy's name? Because I don't want to use my friend's real name. Oh, wait. Explain again. Say one more time. Just throw out a, a, a name because I don't want to use my friend's real name. Just Broxton, Broxton like, yeah. Okay. So, Braxton? Close enough, yeah. Braxton. Sure. I'm hanging out with my friend Matt. I'm like, hey, what's up? He goes, oh, I hung out with Braxton last week. I'm like, oh, cool. What'd you guys do? Well, Braxton had taken a little too much psychedelics and called up Matt and said, I'm peeking really hard. Can you come over? I don't want to be alone. And I go, what'd you guys do? He goes, we watch fish tank live. And I go, what's fish tank live. And this is how it was described to me. And I promise you at home, I'm not spoiling anything about the show by telling you the following information. So Sam Hyde took eight weirdos from the internet, locked them in a house for 42 days, blocked out all the windows. The only media they had to consume was a DVD of Stuart little Two. I did see the Unabomber's book in the house because that's the only book that outsells me under anarchism and Amazon. Torments them. Um, at one point, obviously, if you have eight people, it shows it random from the internet. One of them is not only a pedo, pedophile, but had written a book about it, How to Seduce Camp Kids. Uh, and to your great credit, Sam, as soon as you found this out, I asked Matt, I'm like, did he play along with it? He goes, no, no, no. They kicked him out immediately. At various points, Sam just brings in homeless people to live with these people. And... It is as insane as you think. And now they're doing season two, which takes place in the 70s. Um, I would love to know, just from you, Jet, the backstory. And I want to thank you, Sam, because you're the guy who, when people sit around and be like, wouldn't it be great if someone did this? You actually did it. Like, what was the backstory behind putting this together? By the way, it's Jet is the director. I'm the, I'm the host. It's sort of a creative duo type thing. Yeah. Um, the backstory... Yeah. Are you familiar with um, Ice Poseidon? No. Ice Poseidon did a stream a long time ago that was um, it was a stream based on the Stanford prison experiment, I believe. Yeah. And uh, he had just his fans. Can we move that mic closer to you, Sam, because you're, you're a little quiet. Um, Ice Poseidon did a stream that was based on the Stanford prison experiment where he had his fans come and be in a house and be in um, – prison prison cells and it was less it was less of a reality show thing and more of a just people being tortured thing but um i saw that when it originally aired and um just thought it would be cool to do hell house which would be more game show format more um ideally not not having fans come be the be the contestants but having yeah. people that want to be on reality shows which this time around, it was pretty hard to it was hard to find people to, to who didn't know about the show. But season one, um, I think we did a pretty good job of that. 
Uh, but that's the that's the impetus for it. And um, Jet found that uh, that document in my pile of documents and just ran with it and created the show based on that. Are you? There was an Onion parody show on YouTube like 20 years ago called Sex House, where basically they're locked in this like Big Brother type house and it gets increasingly dark. And yeah. spoiler alert, like at the very end, they find the escape and they just lock the door and they're like, let's stay in here. And yeah. you actually, I'll just spoil one thing, you actually parallel this because one of the cast members of season one, at one point she goes, I like it here. I don't want to leave. I like the challenges. I like learning. And I, she yeah, yeah. explicitly says, I like not having freedom. <laughs> yeah, they all get they all get Stockholm syndrome with about within about five days. Surprisingly, in a short period of time, people get uh, psychologically locked in. I I want to know um, how then the what spray the, comes out. It's is that's yeah. Well, I want to know what the casting process was like, if you're allowed to say. Uh, it, eh, we gotta we'll do we're gonna do like a pro casting thing next time because this time we did. Craigslist and the uh, the fans they kind of immediately found the Craigslist post and mm -hmm. started started flooding the uh, casting email with with auditions. So it was I don't I think we found maybe Shinji. We have one person who's yeah. not who's not a fan this time around. And still he was hooked up. He was he was uh, shown the show by a fan. Yeah. So it was uh, the fans were hunting us down on Craigslist. They they found their way in. And once we realized that. There was no way to not let them in. The our our way of combating that was to tell them that they were all the only fan. And the first challenge was um, one of the first challenges after uh, Sam made them count rice for the second time was uh, if you if you are the fan, they all we all told them they were the only fan. But if you get found, if you reveal that you're the fan, you're going to be eliminated. So every one of them individually thought they were being hunted by the others. So they kept it close to their chest until the grand realization that they were all fans. It was a cool moment, but uh, going forward, we want to we want people who are oblivious to what we're up to. Um, it's it's funnier for the audience if they if the audience knows more than they do. That's that's like, yeah, the thing you guys did with the show, and I want to know if this is by design, is it very much feels like boiling the frog. Like at first it comes out like, okay, this is an experiment, something people are familiar with Big Brother. And it gets darker and darker and, and more effed up. And the thing is, at that point, there's the sunk cost because you're like, I've been in this house for 20 days. Am I really going to quit now? And it's like, yes, <laughs> yeah. you should get out. Like, it's not going <laughs> to get better for you. Um, yeah. Was that by design or were you just like trying to amp it up as, as time went on? That's that's intentional. And I but this this time around, because everybody was a fan and kind of in on the joke and knew what it was going to be, we sort of had to go um, go a little more extreme right off the bat. One of the things that's really fun about season one is um, when you when you watch it played back, it's it's very gradual, and it. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't think we even turned TTS on until late like day six or something. Yeah, like a little late in the game there, and they start hearing voices coming out of these speakers. So next uh, season three, what we're gonna do is we're going to um, we're gonna have to bite the bullet and pay like a Hollywood casting agency, like professional casting people, and really conceal the. Um, conceal the casting process so that we get more more people like Dunye. Dunye is a uh, Dunye is great because Dunye is a re, uh, and uh, he aspires to be on reality shows. He he does not aspire to be on this show. Have you been watching season 2 at all? No, I don't want to I, I have not. I, the, I, I um, there's a there's this this black guy Dunye who's super loud and um, um he kind of he's kind of annoying but a lot of the time he drives the uh like he he keeps the show moving when there's when there's silence. I think it's kind of an important thing. But he's good because he wants really badly to be on a reality show. He doesn't care necessarily that, that he's on Fish Tank, and that's the type of type of people that we want for season three is people who are really aspire to be on a reality show because that's who we want to punish is people who uh, their their life goal is to be on a reality show. Which is surprisingly a lot of people are like that. It's not that's not hyperbole. That's like the way a lot of people are is I could be on TV one day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of the whole Warhol when Warhol started talking about how, how important fame is. And I think a, for a lot of people, they know they're never going to be a prominent actor or director or author or whatever talk show host. This mm -hmm. is their only shot to kind of be on TV. And it's become this very weird, bougie goal. 
and yeah. it's like maybe this made sense in the 90s but it's the internet now you could have a youtube channel you could have whatever you want mm -hmm. and they really just want to be uh, you know tv stars it's yeah. very outdated almost um what it still has cachet even if you tell people that it's a web show and not an actual not a hulu show it's a show that's on the internet it's still it's still people are chomping at the bit for their chance to um win not that much money you know one of the things that you also do even the show is much more twisted than let's suppose um the real world you actually treat these people like a lot nicer like you seem to actually care about your cast and when people are like not having a good time you're, you're doing your best instead of amping it up and being like you should go get more drunk and fight with them you're like rooting for them and want them to be happy to succeed uh is, was that something a surprise how much sympathy you gathered for the cast as time went on uh no i think we both are, we were not uh, we're pretty sympathetic people i don't think that was uh and and the um no nah, it just felt it felt normal getting to empathizing with the with the cast we try to we try to be good to people when we kick them off too like we try to make sure everybody leaves with uh you know a couple thousand bucks and oh uh doesn't um isn't isn't pissed off i think it's it's bad to have people leave on a on a sour note unless they you know unless they really fuck off early or, or um are not are really just not interesting to watch even Brittany, who we kicked off today was um she was she was interesting based on how uninteresting yeah. she was like i think people um she was a fun thing a fun uh, focus for people's hatred because of how um, sort of plain Jane she was at times and then other times like really artlessly um, <laughs> bitchy. Yeah. <laughs> so we try to see the, the silver lining uh, on, on most of these people. I mean, the, the, the one the, cast, oh, go ahead, Jet. Uh, I was just going to say on the, on the empathizing thing and, and um, bringing our goal for a lot of people, we, we have one person on season two, uh, TJ. He's a young guy, showed up with like long hair, very nervous and fidgety. Um, like the challenges and the things that they have to overcome lead to like character growth a lot of the times. And everyone comes in with a problem. And it's interesting to see them. The, the goal is to like, uh, it's, it's a joke that people say it's like um, autistic kid, like boot camp for like socialization camp. And, um, and there is, that's the positive side of it is like seeing people, seeing these like poorly socialized internet people that a lot of the audience can relate to coming out, being like a, a stronger, more confident person. Um, I, the, the intention of a lot of the challenges is to like bring out the best of them. And, uh, it, I, it's very gratifying to see them, uh, progress in their character. That's the one thing that really gets us attached to people. Uh, just like the audience does is like seeing someone grow and change um that's that's like the the purpose behind uh some of these extreme challenges is like can you can you overcome it the person you were on day one would not have done this uh, a... can you jump through the hoop can you make a can you make it happen Folks, did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? So if you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Maid's bed sheets. They're inspired by NASA. They use silver-infused fabrics and make temperature-regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. These sheets are infused with silver that help prevent up to 99.7% bacterial growth, leaves them cleaner, fresher, three times longer than other sheets, no more gross odors, and they're very comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five-star hotels. Stop sleeping in bacteria because it can clog your pores. It causes breakouts and acne. Sleep clean with Miracle. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice to try the sheets today. And it's the new year. Whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use promo code malice at checkout, you get three free towels and save an extra 20%. They're so confident in their product, it's back with a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you aren't 100% satisfied, roll refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice and use code malice to get your free three-piece towel set. Save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash malice to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. Folks, I want to talk to you about Bone Charge. It's a holistic wellness brand with a huge range of evidence-based products to optimize your life in every way. It's founded on science and it's inspired by nature and all Bone Charge products adopt ancestral ways of living in our modern day world. And one of their best products is their infrared sauna blanket. 
How it works, it raises your heart rate to that of physical exercise, so it burns calories while you relax. You can burn up to 600 calories in just one session. It helps to flush out heavy metals and other toxins by sweating and infrared heat and elevates your heart rate while releasing endorphins, so it can leave you feeling euphoric after your session. It's easy to set up, takes less than a minute. You can enjoy a session for 30, 40 minutes, relaxing, reading, watching TV, meditating, whatever. You'll feel less stressed, and it's a great addition to your wellness routine. Bond Shard ships worldwide in rapid time. It's made from vegan leather, free shipping on every sauna blanket, and here's the thing, 30-day trial, easy returns and exchanges with a 12-month warranty. Here's all you got to do. Go to bonecharge.com slash welcome. Use code welcome to save 50% off. That's B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E.com slash welcome and use code welcome to save 15% off. Let's get back to the show. There's a really sweet moment in season one where you give them just a math test and they're all really into it. They're like really studying hard and it's just like, they're like, I want to do good on this test. And it's like, it's really kind of nice and positive. Like there's not really a payoff. I guess the person who does the worst gets kicked out, but they were really into it. I'm like, this is so wholesome. Yeah. The, the one person I wanted to ask about who I really kind of, uh, um, and I hope, I, please let me know if the audience felt the same way. I really felt for, is at random point, you, points you just put in these freeloaders in the house and there's a guy named Chris, who's this young kid who's probably like 300 pounds. He looks like he's from Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Um, and like he's like always <laughs> like shirtless and unclothed. He is on the spectrum, as I said, homeless. And at one point, he just breaks down and he's like, Reddit has been ruining my life for five years. My whole family always picks on me and bullies me. You know, now I'm being clowned and bullied here. And you're like, you know, you and, and when you brought in Frank Hassel, who that's a whole other story, Frank, who's this big troll who like just causes drama wherever he goes, he immediately had his back mm -hmm. and was like, this is a vulnerable person. You shouldn't be making fun of him, blah, blah, blah. Was yeah. it a positive net experience for him? Did the audience feel for him like I did? Yeah. Yeah. People love, people love Airsoft Fatty. <laughs> yeah. He's, com he's coming back Saturday. He's coming back here Saturday. He's moving in. He's moving in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For season two. Oh, that's that's wonderful to hear. Yeah, um, let's see more of them. So, what was your casting criterion when you were trying to find people? Um, not in like the not in like the neoliberal sense, but like literal like diverse, yeah. um, diverse lifestyles, uh, pretty even gender split, uh, different types of people. I mean, I'll I'll just run through the. I, I'm looking at the cams right here. We have sure. We have a, a five two guy from Japan who uh, was a porn actor. We have an extremely nervous, fidgety, autistic kid that had hair down to his ass. We have um, like a, a Texas girl that knits. We have like this this loud mouth reality star gay guy. We have a little Vietnamese guy. We have um, just like the more different the people are, just trying to like hit the archetypes and. Um, to run down the checklist and get a, a wide berth of people. Um, and, and we want to go for people who are kind of uh, underrepresented in traditional reality shows. Like if you watch Survivor, it's it's all the entire male cast is their hair is probably down to here and they're like ripped with tribal tattoos and they're wearing pearl necklaces or not pearl, but like Book a shell. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like <laughs> it's, you see the same thing every time. Uh, but you don't see like a 350 pound like autistic kid uh like throwing shit at the wall um and, and having a meltdown so that's like that's we like that more than uh than the normal stuff that happens on reality tv yeah let, let's talk a bit about that because when you lock a bunch of people in the house at a, any house at a certain point he's going to be like lord of the flies and at a certain point like people are flinging poo and pee everywhere uh, what, like, what is it on like productions and that you're like, is this good? Or like, do we have to put a stop to this? Cause at a certain point, like there's going to be a liability issue and health is a concern. Yeah. You can go pretty far with poop and pee. <laughs> I didn't see any health issues. <laughs> what about when, uh, seemed you guys, was that seemed healthy to me. What about when you guys decided to kick Frank out of the house? It's a little friendly season? poop and pee play, Michael. <laughs> it wasn't friendly at all. Well, that's your opinion. <laughs> that was their opinion. They were they were getting very violent about it almost. A little bit of violent poop and pee play. Never hurt anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Never hurt 
never hurt anybody. At one point when you guys are like, Frank, you got to get out of the house, he started getting violent and started breaking things. And he's a yeah. big dude. Was that actually something you guys started getting worried about? Mm-hmm. You got worried about that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. A big, a big dude's throwing shit around. He tells you he's about to get violent. Would you be worried? Yes, of course. I, I'm just curious. I want to hear more your, what, what, through your head and, and, and you know what the process was there. The process was there was a big dude who was throwing handfuls of shit and piss. And he was saying he's going to break the house. He's going to punch people in the face. He's going to get violent. That's a problem. Yeah. That's, that's scary. But you, but you and, do that right now. <laughs> but you, but you, threw, but you brought him back. Cause he's interesting and you got to have poop and pee being thrown. You got to have violence. Yeah, you gotta have violence. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. The show's not really interesting unless people are getting violent and throwing poop and pee. Although, in all fairness, would it be a real fish tank if there wasn't poop and pee? No, it wouldn't. No. That's, I mean, that's how fish tanks work. you got to clean the, yeah. the poop out. Yeah. So <laughs> there was one other part of the story, that, and I want to hear more about this. He's supposed to be here tonight, too, by the way. Who yeah. is Frank? Yeah. We're walking him in in like 30 minutes. For those who don't know, if you look him up, Frank, Frank Hassel, his back is a giant tattoo of 9-11 with people falling out of the buildings and like heads exploding and, and, and yep. things like this. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, I, I'm curious also, like at one point my, Matt told me that the stream went down and some rapper had to come in and pay for their streaming costs. Can you tell that story? Is that from season one? Yes. Did that not happen? Which rapper paid oh, for no, the stream? We costs? said Dr. Disrespect. <laughs> oh, is that a lie? Yeah, yeah. No, we were just fucking around. <clears throat> Matt's we, so stupid. Oh, okay. Well, he told me that. A, we had a contractor come in because the house got so destroyed. We were having yeah. Like, we're having like basically hard hats walk in mid season and see the destruction. And we're trying to get a quote on fixing the place. Cause we rented it on, on, on like a handshake too. It wasn't even like a properly drafted contract. So we're trying to do right by the guy that we're renting the house from. So we have, we're having these hard hats come through and the guy looks like Dr. Disrespect, a, a big, a big part. And he, that's like a popular streamer. So uh, then we said, we just make shit up. And, and we, I think we said the site went down and the show was ending <laughs> And, and that's something we fight now, even to this day, because it was just we just lied. Like the show was not ending; we were just saying the show was over to fuck with the people inside. Mm -hmm. But to this day, there's still articles claiming Fish Tank Live has a premature end, a sad premature end, and it's like ba carbon dated, like ba baked in history. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we just we just said Doctor Disrespect um, bought out the show, and we made all of the the contestants shout him out and thank him constantly, even though he had nothing to do. Oh my god, that's hilarious. So we just kind of roped him in. Hope he uh, isn't too tilted about that. Big fan. What was, the, what were the moments where you guys were most worried that okay, this is getting off the rails, and we got to put like we got to get our hands on that steering wheel really quick. Uh, every day. There were a, there were a bunch of occasions. One, uh, I think at one point the plumbing backed up, and that was um, that was pretty scary. It was it was looking like it was going to be a high dollar fix. And none of the toilets, uh, we had to tell people to stop using the toilets and the sinks and stuff. That was pretty bad. Um, the police were involved uh, quite a Ooh. few times. We had a lot of swatting. We ended up having a um, huge uh, bill for police detail with the city because um, the fix the fix to the swatting situation is just hire the police to sit outside. Okay. So that's now a rolling expense that we have to deal with. And um, what else? I think when uh, Airsoft Fatty spit at Letty, yeah, um, spit on Letty, that was kind of... Uh, or when Mara threw bleach at Airsoft Fatty and Fatty was saying, bring that cop in. I know there's a cop outside. Bring him in. Bring the cop in right now. I want to press charges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, there was... I mean, that's, that's the nature of um, Fish Tank is like... Even to, even today on season two, yesterday, uh, ten feet to my left over here, there's um, a big hole in the wall with a bunch of rags dripping into a trash can because the basement flooded. Um, okay. Every day there's like some major catastrophe, and then every day there's like within the same day, within the same twenty four hours, there's this shining moment of um, like the best. It, I'll we'll walk away like, damn, that was the best thing that ever happened on the show, and it's back to back, so it's. There's major disasters constantly, and, and the the trouble is just like bouncing back from them. Um, but on that's, season that's part two, of the fun. 
we had a girl punch another girl in the face. Oh. And it was like a good punch too. It wasn't like a cat fight. It was like a solid, a solid hook. It was like 48 hours ago. Yeah. Oh, damn. <laughs> and we had to, the staff had to beat up one of the contestants twice. Twice. Yeah. We had a revolt last night. Yeah. I we saw. haven't even had time to talk about that, but we had to, Ben had to beat somebody up to stop the revolt. I saw. Jesus. Um, <laughs> So, I, I first of all, I want to commend you guys because you know I like edgy humor a lot. But when you actually found out you had a pedo in the house, mm-hmm. you weren't like like making a joke of it. You're like, all right, this has got to stop immediately. Well, you- I don't know if that's going to be fish tank policy moving forward. I think season three is going to be pedo house. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that'll be really easy to cast on the internet. Like that's not gonna be yeah, yeah, the cast will be much easier. <laughs> yeah, we could just see you find them on the map. <laughs> can, you, can you can you can you walk us through how you found it? Because I think that I think it was like the the fans who uncovered it and brought it to your attention. Can you walk us through that process? Well, the first that's that's the fun of uh, the feeding frenzy of the first few days is all of the fans. Uh, playing detective work and figuring out who these people are. And we can, um, the fans are better at it than us, oftentimes, yeah. as evidenced by uh, that situation. But uh, yeah, that's like, it's um, it's like a poker game. You're waiting for the next card to turn. Uh, you're waiting for the flop. Uh, that's, you're, you're waiting to see what cards turn up in the first three days and see who these people really are. Because um, no matter what, the, the fans will find stuff you can't believe about these people. But I mean, what was your reaction when you learned about that? I mean, it must have been a bit immediate meeting. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we we just. I don't think it was a meeting. I think it was probably it was probably just a text message. It was probably just a text that said, "Hey, look, he, Simmons is a pedo." Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, what I I what was your reaction when someone who you've had a good relationship with? was exposed as someone who's authoring a book and how to seduce well, children. I didn't, the thing is, I didn't have a good relationship with him. Okay. And I think like a few days prior to that, I said in the kitchen something like, um, I can't wait to kick you off my show. Oh. <laughs> to, to him, just just as like a guess. Like I was just guessing that he was going to be the he next one. Nice. So, yeah. Um, and he was definitely like a total weirdo. So I, it, it wasn't like, oh, no, I got to go tell my friend okay. bad okay. news. It was like, oh, yeah, cool! Yeah. I get to go abuse this Chinese guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, the the other character who I really liked in season one is that girl Sylvia, and that was really touching when you got her to leave. Um, I feel like a lot of times when someone's like, she's a little chubby, and that's fine. But I feel like the internet's really cruel to people like that. Uh, did she leave on a good note? Did the fans? Yeah, no, she she gets a lot of respect from the um, fans. I think. Um, she's she's not she's not even really chubby in real life. She's just, but you know how the internet is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's but, a woman, and but she's she stayed she stayed through the tough the tough spots, and I think earned respect from people. Like I think she's um, she's she's seen in a good light by fans of the show at this point for sure. That's the other thing when people leave. Um, of course, like the the experience on the show is like very um, it's it can be hateful at times. But when people leave, um, the everything calms down and cooler heads prevail. The fans get uh, respect for these people for um, on and uh, people. That's one thing I see a lot. People compare the season two people to the season one people. And they're like, man, these people were troopers for what they went through. Cause now anytime someone's having a bad time or crying their eyes out because of the stress or whatever, um, they're being compared to these other people who uh, weathered the storm. So even if in the, in, in the moment, these people are getting um, picked on by chat or whatever. Uh, <laughs> later on, they get respect. And Sylvia is, we love Sylvia. Sylvia, uh, last night, uh, I'm, I'm running chat live. She's in the chat. We, she has an account. She's Now she's fucking with the Good. other contestants. Okay. I, I, like gave her, that. I gave her 5,000 tokens last <laughs> night so she can just fuck <laughs> with people. Good. Uh, and then we have, like, we'll print out a receipt whenever, if she orders, like, a bed snatcher, which is you go take someone's bed there's a receipt it'll have her name on it so it's like a former contestant fucking with a, a current one and uh it's just it's just a cool little ecosystem there we that's we we like all the people who were on the show sylvia's uh big respects to sylvia much love to her 
Hey folks, Michael Malice here. You might know me as a Twitter troll, terrible author, insufferable podcaster, but I'm also an underwear model, and the underwear that I model and wear every day is sheath underwear. If you go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE, you get 20% off and you can be inside my pants. Why I love sheath is they have special dual pouch technology for both parts of your male anatomy. It sounds weird. The first time I tried them on, I'm like, what is this? And now I literally wear them every day. The great thing about Sheath, it was developed by an Iraq war veteran. And you know, overseas, it gets really, really hot. And Bobby decided, all right, what can I do to make sure I'm not suffering here in this heat? And thanks to his research, you can be comfortable in the comfort of your own home. It's great for cold weather. It's great for hot weather. It keeps you secure and comfortable. And there's something really exciting about going on a job interview, going on a date, doing a podcast, knowing that your underwear has you in its grip, nice and secure and comfortable. Go to sheathunderwear.com, use promo code MALICE, you get 20% off, and you can get one step closer to looking as much like a hunk as myself. Let's get back to the show. Is, the sh is Fish Tank Live part of an accelerationist move movement to bring about so much degeneracy in a Weimar America as to force a fascist counterreaction? No. Can, uh, can you run something upstairs? Yeah. Um, maybe make them eat hot peppers or something, or make them eat a birthday cake or something. Real quick. Ben, this can is you our, say hi to the camera? Ben, ben is just some face the, soldier, the soldier of season two. This is the guy right The actual here. main character. No, 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 no. This is, this is the team right here. He uh, just won his. Disease. Was that your first boxing match that you've won? My first boxing match I've ever won in my whole life. Yeah. Autistic against, a drunk, against a drunk autistic kid. Beat his, Wait, ass. Yeah. beat his ass. Beat his ass. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sam, did you ever hear from Hassan after you after you said you were going to kill him? No, nothing. Nothing from Hassan. Actually, he might have said that he thought it was funny or something. Oh. I don't know if that, don't know if that clip was taken out of context, but if it wasn't, good for him. Okay, cool. That is good for him. Um. Something else that happened, I'm watching season one, and it's very rare that I get jealous of people because I support my friends and I want good things to happen for them. But I see my buddy Alex Stein just appears in the house. Like for, He's in a mask for five minutes, then it's just Alex Stein being Alex Stein. Are you guys friends? How did that happen? Oh, yeah. He swings for he swings for us, man. Alex is um, he's as close to – he. I would consider him part of the team. He's like – he gave us uh, Dunya, a current contestant. He, he oh. looked out for us. He, when he came on he the show, Charleston White too. Charleston White. He gave us. He um he he hooks it up, and he really wants the show to be entertaining. Alex has former experience. He was on the Glass House. He knows yep. reality TV. Uh, so when he came on, it was at a point where the on-site staff was very burnt out, and he he knew what to do. He um he knew the camera angles. He was a fan yep. of the show, so he would he was like directing while he was in the house and he did a really good job. Alex, it's, I'm glad to hear that's your friend. He, he, he's the best. He's great. Oh yeah. And he's the sweetest guy. guy. Yeah. He came with, uh, he came with Don Terry as, as uh, homeless, as the homeless guy he, he rolls with. Yes. He paid for everything. He like brought him out, got his travel, everything. He just, he wants the show to be good. And uh, that's, he's definitely an ally. A lot of respect to him. For sure, uh, I love Alex. Prime time. What kind of uh, uh, like negative uh, feedback have you guys gotten? Have you gotten like some kind of shitty articles anywhere? You mean in terms of like article articles? Yeah, or like just shit, like horrible journalists coming after you. Has that happened? Yeah, yet? nothing, nothing really. Oh, yeah, yeah. Not uh, that I, I was, know. I was surprised that the articles were pretty positive. If there, if funny. if there ever is anything, there's not, there's nothing an article. There's nothing a journalist or article type thing could do that's any worse than what the fans do. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, Sam, for, last time... For instance, the fans right now are trying to help us out by crashing the town that we're in's uh, Zoom town hall meeting. That's how they're going to help us. Oh, and they're, help they're helping us by um, calling the mayor a Jew. So we have, we're in some hot water over here. We got the the uh, address got doxed, okay. and uh, the local the local paper wrote an article about how the neighbors are not too happy with the show, and so our fans we call them the army they've mo <laughs> they've mobilized to call the mayor a Jew. <laughs> Is the mayor Jewish? I don't know. I didn't. I haven't checked. But that's that's the type of help that we get. 
that's a, that's the helping hand we get over here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, man. But yeah, yeah I'm, but not too, it, I'm not too worried about articles at this point. Yeah, but let's talk a bit about this because when you when I interviewed you years ago, this was in the midst of uh, you were in the middle of a shitstorm. Like every horrible outlet was trying to cancel you. They got your show canceled from Adult Swim. Uh, can, can you talk about – and you actually talked about that to one of the contestants in the first season about how, look, I, I know what this is like. And you gave them some really good advice. Can you help people out who – what would you tell them if, the, if like the media is coming for them for ridiculous well, listen, reasons? Listen, every um... – First of all, if you want to, your whatever your PR policy is, no matter who you are, you should model it after the Church of Scientology, which is attack, attack, yeah. attack, never defend, attack in the dirtiest, most secretive, fucked up possible way. Um, if you can, if you can get away with uh, dumping acid on someone's face, do that. Um, probably, <laughs> whatever. That's that's uh, number one. Which actually, I don't. I don't believe in. Um, I think. I'm, I try to. I try to do what Jesus would want me to do. To okay. Be honest with you. But <clears throat> if you're going to be responding to articles, the way to do it is as though you're a member of the Church of Scientology, literally. Um, but the, the 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 Adult Swim thing. What I what I had done was I had built. Like like uh, like all legacy media people and like most like many many um, many people still now I built my business on quicksand I uh, I made this uh, with my friends we made this show um, you know on someone else's network and we're when you do that you're at the you have to you if you're on someone else's network you have yep. to play ball according to how they want you to to play ball and sometimes those rules are restrictive sometimes those rules are you know if you're not uh um if you're not racist those rules can be easy to follow i guess or sometimes you'll have to put on makeup and go suck anderson cooper's dick i don't know how it works in hollywood really to that degree but um i'm glad i'm not a uh 18 year old rapper uh going to puffy flavor camp or whatever but uh, every, everybody has to play. If you're, you know, playing on someone else's field, you have to play ball according to how they they want you to. Whether it's um, holding your tongue and saying certain things, or you know, sucking fucking uh, who's Clive Davis, some record, some whatever. Okay, whatever. Um, so yeah, we just at fish tank. We did. We tried to do it not that way this time around. So it's a totally custom website. Um, the partners on the back end that it relies on are partners that can be swapped out probably the same day um, if things go if things go south. Thankfully, there there are people that we really like working with and haven't had a problem with the content so far. But um, if anybody's like, "Oh, you can't do that," all right, we'll, we'll find a new payment processor or whatever. We'll do that tomorrow. Um, so yeah, just don't build your business business on quicksand, I guess. Well, the other piece of advice, which I'm sure you'll agree with, is realize that when you're working for somebody else, they're not your friend, that you're a commodity and they're going to be very nice and take you to dinner and, and shake your hand and so on and so forth. At the end of the day, it's a business. And if they're getting heat, the idea that they're going to go to bat for you, don't ever count on that because the odds are very, very low that they're going to stick out their neck out for your behalf because the costs for them are, might be pretty high, even if they did have the best of intentions. Yeah, 100%. Um, I'm very curious and impressed with where did you get those suits? Because they're pretty badass. The yellow suit? The Which blue suit? Yeah, the, 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 yeah. Blue, the blue one is from itailor.com. Okay. Why are you impressed by it, though? It's ill-fitting and made of poor materials. Because it looks good on camera, and I like to dress loud when I do media appearances. You just get custom made. Yeah. Unless you want but, something that feels really disgusting and cheap. The itailor.com is terrible, though. That suit's garbage. Okay, what about the new one? It looks it, it looks fine on camera because it's um, because uh, they're security cameras, you know. But in, in person, it's not a nice suit. It looks terrible. Yeah, no. The <laughs> new the new ones are the same deal. I had um for season two, I have uh '70s uh polyester and leather Curious George suits that are really unpleasant to wear, and they're 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 pretty tight as as well. Is there any point for both of you guys where you're just sitting in bed or whatever and you're like, what the fuck are we doing? No, nah, we know no. what we're doing. Yeah, we know what we're doing. I, yeah. like, I like it. My bed's right yeah. over here. And I, like, and I 
and I sleep on the ground with dirt. Um, yeah, you see oh, this? Yeah. Jesus Christ. That's, that's the bedroom. This is all, it's like sounds of the lambs. When I go yeah. to bed, I, I feel good. Yeah. Like, all right, this is where I should be. I love being in the basement. It's great. It's a dream. Uh, it's happy. Yeah. I, I apologize for this Barbara Walter question, Barbara Walter's question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, if you went back to day one of season one, what would you have told yourself? What advice would you have given yourselves? I don't think anything. I think the I think part of this whole thing is just rolling with the punches and letting these, um, letting the accidents happen and, and adapting as it as it goes. I think the um, the accidents and the fuck ups are part of what made season one interesting. And same for season two. Yeah. It is a reality show in the purest form that people, uh, you know, walking or or not being able to handle it or even the disappointing things that happen that piss the audience off sometimes. They're all real life events happening. So um, I wouldn't change anything from how we handled season one or season two. I think it's uh, I really believe in like synchronicity and things happening how they should be um, and certain things lining up. Call, Call it God. Call it whatever i know that uh it's it's like a holy mission so I, i'm just i just try to think that um everything is happening how it should be and um yeah just roll with it where are you guys finding homeless people to be freeloaders and how are you pitching this to them that was actually really difficult because um <laughs> yeah. i think um you know how uh you know those key and Pe- those Jordan Peele movies or what is it? Jordan Peele makes the movies. Yeah. Yeah, like Get Out, whatever. Get out, yeah. And there's one. Is there one where it's like all the rich people are eating people? That's like Get Out, I think. Is that, is that what they do in Get Out? I think yeah. the average. Um, if you really, if you really ask the average black person on the street what they're thinking, it's it would be this. They'd be thinking this. These white people trying to kill me. Michael Mouse, this white motherfucker trying to eat me. So I went around Providence. I first of all, I got a. <laughs> this was a poor choice, but I, I got a U-Haul van because I didn't want to ruin my nice truck with stinky homeless guy smell. So I got a U-Haul van, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'll go, I'll go around and get a bunch of homeless people to be in this van, <laughs> and uh. The first, I went past a um, I went past the homeless shelter, and I learned the thing that you should never ask a homeless person. I asked him, "Hey, you want a job?" And he went, "Nope," and walked and walked. <laughs> he walked past like I was bothering him. I was the homeless guy bothering the the rich businessman in this in this instance. He speed walked past me like he was going to Wall Street or something, um, and then. I found this. I drove around. I went to uh, McDonald's and I found this big, like, baleful guy that looked like Michael Clark Duncan. Yeah. And um, I was like, "Hey, man, you want an acting gig? I'll give you three hundred for the day." And he was like, "Acting gig? What type of gig is that? What are you talking about? Acting? I don't know." And I was like, "No, nah, man, it's really good." And he looks over and he sees my idling U-Haul van in the background. And I was like, I'll do 500 for the day. <laughs> and it's like, a, it's, it's in my mind, in my memory, it's framed like a movie about a serial killer who goes around killing homeless black people because of his reaction and his face. He's like, no, I think I'm good. <laughs> You and probably tell the story to this day. Like, that's yeah. the decision. That's the reason he's still alive. Yeah, 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 no yeah, yeah, yeah. So then anyway, um, I found the guy that we actually used. I found him at an intersection. Wait, wait. I got to interrupt because I'm imagining that this homeless guy see, has seen footage of you as a school shooter. And it's like, no. I know you. You shoot <laughs> up those schools. I'm like, you're a man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, last, the last guy we found was at, a, at, at an intersection. And I paid him 300 and he got in the van and immediately, immediately started regretting and second guessing his decision. And he's like, uh, barely able to put together a sentence. I don't know if you remember that, oh, yeah, but Warren. then Warren, and he's like, um, 
There's cam. What do you mean? There are cameras. Where? There's gonna be cameras. <laughs> Where? And then we got him. We got him in the basement to sign the contract. And I knew in his mind he was looking at the signature field, thinking about every time he's heard a rapper say that they signed their soul away to the devil on a contract. And his face, I could read it on his face. His face was, I wrote, I'm a real about to sign that white people contract. I ain't going to sign no white people contract. Which is probably a good instinct of his because the contract was 45 pages long. <laughs> it said, and it said all kinds of shit in it. Like we can use his likeness forever. and Life story, his, right? We, we, can, we have the rights to his life story and all this other shit. <laughs> but anyway, he, he signed it and he, he proceeded to do the worst, lowest effort hide and seek seeker upstairs that I've ever seen. Like yeah. not even looking in closets or anything, just going from room to room, walking in or walking in and out, uh, trying to find people, but really not understanding how to play hide and seek, I guess. And then we tried to offer him to stay to like move in. And I guess the how being in fish tank was so much worse than being homeless that like 400 a day was not worth it. He was like, Nah, I want, I want to go home. Where, where'd you find Chris then? Because he seemed pretty clean and together. He didn't look like he came off the airsoft. Street. Airsoft Eddie. Yeah. He's just a, he's a friend of ours. He's just a um, his uh, his manager is our uh, you know hit us up and now he's part of the Chris is more part of the crew. He's not really a a homeless guy that we uh, abuse. Oh. We we he's um um the thing about Chris is that he can he can save an uninteresting situation and make it interesting. Um, and he's he's really good at that. That's his special talent. Folks, gold has soared past $2,000 an ounce. The wars in Israel and Ukraine, as well as rate cuts that are on the table, are fueling gold's meteoric rise. Deutsche Bank, UBS, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, they're all forecasting sizable rate cuts in an election year. Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan, Larry Fink of BlackRock, they point out similarities to the 70s. In 1979, we had the Iran hostage crisis, war in the Middle East, and major cities in disarray and stagflation. Gold went from $158 an ounce in 74 to $850 an ounce in 1980. Meanwhile, our national debt is skyrocketing ever higher. There's a direct correlation to the national debt and the price of gold. In 2020, the U.S. debt was $23 trillion and gold was $1,500 an ounce. In 2023, the national debt is $33 trillion and gold is over $2,000 an ounce. Donald Trump warned that the U.S. dollar is no longer being the world standard, and that will be our greatest defeat in 200 years. So here's what you can do. Call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. Mention my name. That's Michael Malice, and you'll always get best-in-class service from Patriots, protecting Patriots. Patriot Gold Group has the No Fee for Life IRA, where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver, and you may be eligible for the No Fee for Life IRA on qualifying rollovers. All you have to do is call 888-505-9845 to get a free investor guide today, or even easier, just go to malicegold.com. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs' top-rated gold IRA dealer seven years in a row, so just call 888 888- 505-9845 or go to malicegold.com. Protect your money against the Fed and inflation. Sometime in the early 80s, REO Speedwagon's airplane made an unannounced middle-of-the-night landing. This is my friend Kyle McLaughlin, the star of Twin Peaks. And he's telling me about how he discovered a real-life Twin Peaks in rural North Carolina not far from where he filmed Blue Velvet. What was on the plane was copious amounts of drugs coming in from South America. Supposedly, Pablo Escobar went looking for other spots, quiet, out-of-the-way places to bring in his cocaine. My name is Joshua Davis, and I'm an investigative reporter. Kyle and I talk all the time about the strange things we come across, but nothing was quite as strange as what we found in Varnumtown, North Carolina. There's crooked cops, brother against brother. Everyone's got a story to tell, but does the truth even exist? Welcome to Varnum Town. Varnum Town is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Let's get back to the show. 
I, I want to ask Sam if you're are you like me in that you grew up on Howard Stern because Howard Stern had the whack pack which is kind of somewhat similar to what you guys are doing and if so are you what are your thoughts about what's happened with Stern recently and what he's become uh, I to an, to an extent yeah I think seeing uh, private parts was my favorite comedy movie before uh, I think maybe before Ace Ventura did that come, I think I saw it before I saw Ace Ventura but um, that movie was a big deal. <laughs> and yeah, for sure, listen to Howard Stern a, a good amount as a kid. Um, but now he's just got the uh, listen, man. These Jewish guys, um, the the dual loyalty. It's it's hard to fight the dual loyalty, you know. And I do know. It's that's just part it's in of our it. blood. <laughs> it's in your blood. And the other the other part, honestly, is his aging and uh, not having testosterone because there's plenty. Okay. Of this, there's plenty of non-Jewish guys. You know the general Mark Milley? Yeah, of course. It's just something that happens. To, when guys age, they become old ladies. And yeah, you're right. Everything they say is fucking gay. Like this, it's, that's, that's what it is, really. It's that and the, the dual loyalty. And it's not, like, um, it's not like any of that negates what he did or how funny um, his content in the past was, you know? It's just some guy getting, some guy getting old, some Jewish yeah. guy getting old. And but I'm just, I'm surprised to what extent someone who was so good and so provocative could be so generic and basic now. I would think that he would at least know better, but that testosterone thing actually makes a lot of sense. It's the thus uh, sick transit Gloria Mundi. That's, that's how it is. People people fall off. They, you either die or you become a... a... <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's how um, it is, Shout out to Norm MacDonald for leaving gracefully yeah you know he never even told people that he had cancer the greatest greatest comedian is he your favorite but, um, comedian of all time him and patrice o'neill are my favorite comedians of all time norman patrice um but uh was george carlin in insufferable fruitcake when he was 40 years old no no carlin went out strong yeah what do you mean I don't well, no, I don't know about that. Man. Carlin's pretty ins insufferable. Why, why do you say? Why do you say that? Because um, all of his all of his opinions are Reddit opinions, like uh, especially about religion and uh, stuff like that. He's just was he a fedora? He's a he's a fedora. Yeah. Oh God, I didn't know that. Okay, uh, something I had to ask: What were you like as a kid? Um, an ass. <laughs> how, how so? Overly uh, precocious in a way that wasn't charming. Okay. Were you like a, a hellion in the class? I was a, well. I was a class clown because of how maybe uncomfortable I was or insecure I was. But I was a late bloomer, though. I was a real. Um, awkward mess when I was a kid one of the one of the other thing Matt told me is that you've been given a lot of actually good advice to young men um, as opposed to just kind of you know always being joking around um, mm -hmm. what advice would you have to young men in in fact you could put on your Jordan Peterson hat uh, to young men in 2024 because I think guys who are young are looking for guidance well it's it's uh, extreme it's harder it's hard now because um, there's no there's no um, there are no rituals or traditions for young men to become for boys to become men. Yeah. Um, and there are no, uh, there, there are the, the battles that there are to be fought are not physical battles or even in a, a sense that's immediately apparent to a regular person, a battle. Um, it's, uh, and there's, there's not so much, tangible testosterone boosting glory in participating in the info war, I guess. Um, so you have to find those things, uh, find some way to find some way to graduate from being a boy and becoming a man. Um, and it's just, you know, fuck, I don't know. I'm kind of stumbling right now, but that's the, that's the crux of the problem. I think, um, I don't know if you're a fan of Camille Pagliash. I'm a huge fan of hers, but she makes the point that women are, but men are made. 
that you have to become a man, whereas when you're a woman, you are a woman, and that's your right, nature. Yeah. You don't have to have this kind of like changing of yourself into something else. Well, I, th I think um, what a lot of what is what is so one thing that's that's such a, a source of like visible discomfort on the internet is um, young men uh, the the growing pains, being unwilling to go through the growing pains to become a man, and yeah. like prolonging this period of um, of innocence and de uh, of not innocence but like dependence on other people, um, like it is. If you are an if you are an ugly, if you're a young man, you really have nothing. Like you are a maggot, which is why when you join the army, they call you a maggot. And if you're a young man with nothing and you're ugly. The fastest way to to climb the social um, uh, the social hierarchy and become a protected class is by becoming a woman. Is by saying you're a woman. Yeah. Like if you become trans, you're immediately like you're you go from being the least the least oppressed, like the most hated class, single single young white male, to becoming the top of the hierarchy. You're now in the Caitlyn Jenner uh tier of social hierarchy you know what i mean so if you're ugly and you got a small cock it's easier to be it's whatever i'm getting out in the weeds here it's hard it's hard to find that fight to to that you need to uh become a man and, and the other thing is that they're called growing pains for a reason it's not going to be easy it's going to hurt and it's going to often take a long period of time but it's worth it but a lot of times our whole culture is based on hard work or suffering you don't need to do that it's based on self-indulgence and you are going to be stuck in this kind of perpetual adolescence and who's going to want to have an adolescent as their partner other than simmons perhaps yeah Folks, I encourage you to go to malice.locals.com where Sam is going to take some of your questions. Folks, we're running out of time. Sam, what has been your favorite part of this interview? Um, your smile when I saw you. <laughs> you, you are welcome. <laughs>